Welcome to the Walrus Talks Digital Skills presented by Deloitte. I'm Jennifer Hollett. I am the Executive Director of the Walrus, and we are thrilled to be back here in person at the Isabel Bader Theatre in Toronto and streaming live online at thewalrus.ca. How's everyone doing? And a shout out to folks who are tuning in online at home. We have over 300 households registered for our live stream. This is on digital skills, so let's get digital. We encourage you to share this conversation on social media. Here are the details. You can tag us on any of the platforms at The Walrus, and we encourage you to use our hashtag, hashtag Walrus Talks. What's great about carrying on this conversation on social, it's a way for us to connect this IRL audience in real life to our audience at home and to share this discussion beyond the event. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered within the bounds of Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit. This land is also the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Today, Toronto is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. And we're really honored to carry on a tradition of storytelling. We encourage you to reflect on the land that you're on, whether you're joining us in person or tuning in online from across Canada or even around the world. This year, the walrus turns 20 and we are celebrating 20 years of Canada's conversation, taking a look at who we are now. Find our stories wherever you can, online at thewalrus.ca, in print, on newsstands, or by subscribing to The Walrus. You can also listen to our podcasts or take part in events just like this one. And this work is powered by our community of support, our donors, our supporters, and our partners. So thank you all for joining us and to Deloitte for partnering with us on this event. So we're here to talk about digital skills. And more than ever before, we have seen the rapid growth of technology's role and impact everywhere. I've been working in some version of digital since the late 90s, and I know we say that a lot, but the last six months alone, here we go again. Taking a look as we navigated the pandemic and our jobs became remote to classrooms and moving online, but even taking a look at how technology is impacting services like public transit, we're gonna be examining this era of transition and what it means to all of us. Whether it's the lack of affordable internet or even good internet, poor policies around online safety for young people, or belonging to a generation that feels disconnected from these digital conversations and spaces, Canada is going through a digital divide, or as I would like to say, digital divides, plural. Tonight, we're gonna to get into that and so much more. We'll be exploring these challenges to see how we can all start benefiting from these technological advances. Tonight, we'll be hearing from Daniel Monroe, philosopher and public policy analyst, Doina Onchel, founder and CEO of Hervolution, also a licensed financial broker, Gista Kennedy, graphic illustrator, Indigenous Friends Association, Gordon Chan, innovation lab manager, Future Skill Center, Trisha Grant, Director of Marketing and Communications, Media Smarts. Rob Bennett, Global Vice President, Information Technology, Linamar. And Reka Romaya, CEO, Canada Learning Code. Thank you all for joining us. Hi, my name is Daniel Monroe. I'm a philosopher and political scientist at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Uh, I have two teenage daughters, and every once in a while they'll come home from school and tell me about a, a digital skills activity or a lesson that they had that day. Things like learn to code sessions, cyber safety workshops, or media, media literacy classes. And part of me is happy to hear that they have opportunities to develop the kind of skills that they will need to navigate the digital world. But only part of me is happy. 
My 16-year-old also volunteers at the Ottawa Public Library in a program called Tech Buddies. She and her colleagues help people with limited digital skills complete a range of online tasks. So, for example, they help our older neighbors send emails and manage privacy settings on their accounts. They help new immigrants complete online forms uh, and younger neighbors who don't have technology at home to go online. The Tech Buddies program is fantastic, and I'm really proud of my 16-year-old for being a part of this uh, program. In incremental but meaningful ways, she's helping to bridge the digital skills divides that we have in, in our community. But again, only part of me is, is happy. Another part of me is actually uncomfortable with some digital skills programs and advocacy. Not because I think digital skills aren't important. They are, they are essential, and I think we should teach them. I actually help design and evaluate some digital skills programs, so I have some skin in the game. Um, but I worry about how, about how digital skills advocacy sometimes reinforces the idea that safe and accessible participation in the online world, in the digital world, is primarily an individual responsibility rather than a collective responsibility. I worry about emphasizing individual skills so much that tech firms and policymakers feel that they can shirk responsibility for improving the digital landscape that uh, we all share. The cultural anthropologist Madeleine Ellish worries uh, that we're turning technology users into, and I love this phrase, turning technology users into moral crumple zones and liability sponges. Moral crumple zones and liability sponges. Great phrases. Uh, that is blaming users when things go wrong rather than the structures and systems that set them up to fail in the first place. So what do we mean by this? What does she mean by this? Well, consider accessibility to start. So participating in digital life, as we all know, requires access to technology. But that's technology that many people simply don't have. So the CRTC, for example, reports that while 90% of households in Canada have access to internet at recommended speeds, that falls to less than 40% in rural communities and less than 30% on First Nation reserves. So people in rural communities and on reserve can have stellar digital skills, but without decent infrastructure, they can't participate in digital life as equals. Or consider algorithmic decision making, as we call it. So there are many decisions about social program eligibility and immigration and these sorts of things, as well as customer service and private sector organizations that are made with the assistance of automated systems, that is systems that analyze data to determine eligibility, entry, and engagement. But as we've learned, many automated systems are rife with bias. And as a result, individuals and sometimes whole communities are denied services to which they are entitled uh, or blocked from entering countries that they should be allowed to enter. And these exclusions often tra track demographic features such as gender, race, class, and ability. And what's more, Experts like Virginia Eubanks and Rua Benjamin have found that people who use automated systems in their work tend to view the outputs of these systems as unimpeachable, that is, as more reliable than their own judgment, even when they know that the systems are generating poor results or bad results. Again, digital skills are important, but on their own, they won't protect us in the digital world. Even people with advanced digital skills are susceptible. You can make all the right choices about how to set up your privacy settings, whether to share data or not share data. You can understand algorithmic bias, but the underlying structures and motives of the digital world still leave you and me vulnerable. One last example. Those of you who spend time online know that sooner or later, almost everyone will experience some amount of harassment or abuse, which is often racist, homophobic, ableist, or all of the above. This is what worries me most about my girls being online. According to the Pew Research Center, women and girls are at least three times more likely than men and boys to experience online harassment. <clears throat> and the US Surgeon General recently warned that online harassment and misinformation may actually harm children psychologically and physically. 
for example, by encouraging eating disorders. So it's not surprising then that digital skills programs emphasize cyber safety, especially for girls. And we've become fairly good at warning targeted communities about what they might face and developing some strategies that they can use to deal with the online abuse that they might face. But we're not good at, making, uh, at requiring the makers and owners of technologies to develop the critical perspectives, practices, and sense of responsibility they need to do better. Nor are we especially good at changing the underlying economic incentives that reinforce and amplify misinformation, harassment, and abuse. So if we want an equitable, just, and safe digital world, and I think we should, if we want that, then we need to challenge digital infrastructure that excludes, we need to challenge technologies that reinforce bias, and we need to challenge systems and incentives that amplify harmful content. Yes, again, we need to help individual users develop the skills that they need to participate and survive in the digital world, but we also need to equip tech makers and regulators with the skills and responsibility to reimagine and reshape the digital world in safer, fairer, and more hopeful directions. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Doina Unchal, and I'm the founder of Revolution. Imagine this. You are a 15-year-old girl, and a friend tells you about the amazing STEM program on your way home from school. She participated last year, and she plans to do it again so she can advance her digital skills even further. You go home, and you tell your parents about it, and they want to sign you up. The program is free for low-income families, but the internet cost will be a concern because your home internet increases in cost the more it's used. Also, the only available computer at home is your dad's company laptop that he uses for work. And he needs it during the same hours the program is scheduled. As well, he sometimes goes into the office and takes the laptop with him. Yes, you can go to the library, but their computers have a usage limit. There's a computer at the community center in your neighborhood, but it's often out of order, so you cannot rely on it to complete the program. Your dream has always been to build technology that changes the world, but you can't join any available programs because you don't have access to the digital tools that are crucial to your success. The world is also changing around you, and digital skills have become a requirement to obtaining a job. Your parents are low income, although they both have doctorate degrees from their home countries, and your mom cannot work because after coming to Canada, she needed to take care of you and your siblings. Your dad's education and experience were not enough here, so he took a low-paying low job to make ends meet. You're embarrassed because people look at you as though you chose this life, and many people think that you and your parents are lazy. You live in a low-income housing complex, and you lack access to many services. And sometimes your family depends on food banks for food, clothing, and other necessities. You start to feel depressed because everyone around you seems to be joining the opportunities that your parents have dreamed of, but they seem to be out of reach for you. You express your passion for learning digital skills to your guidance counselor at school, and he asks if you need any help. And you explain that you want to join this program, but you don't want to burden your parents with the high cost of internet usage, and you don't have a computer at home either. So then your guidance counselor makes some phone calls, and he tells you that the program you're interested in offers a Wi-Fi subsidy, as well as provides a laptop to use for the program. On top of this, you can keep the laptop afterwards so that you can use it for your continuous studies. Now it's 10 years later, and you are in a career where you use the skills you learn in the program to make the world better. You create innovative digital solutions to support the world by cleaning the environment so everyone can live healthier lives and, pres um, 
preserve our planet for generations to come. You are considering doing fur going further and want to be a part of a team to create preventative medicine for incurable diseases so that people can live longer and happier lives. This is an example of a program participant at Her Evolution. Imagine if this young woman could not access these programs because she faced barriers without support. Imagine if organizations like Revolution did not exist to break barriers to entry for the most vulnerable members of our societies. And what if the young woman that I described never heard about programs like the ones at Revolution because her guidance counselors or teachers or social workers are not sharing these opportunities with her? For the last 10 years, even before the pandemic, Revolution has worked with thousands of young women, just like the one in my story, to provide opportunities leading to their success. We have been vocal about issues such as lack of access to technology pre-pandemic. Unfortunately, most people believe that because we live in a developed country, everyone has access to something as basic as a computer at home. However, this is not the case. We have had programs where 100% of our participants would join our sessions using a smartphone that was donated from another program, and that smartphone required access to Wi-Fi so that they can access internet. Since then, we have seen tremendous success when industry partners, schools, and other community organizations come together to break these barriers so that incredible young minds have access to technology, learning opportunities and mentors to help them succeed in a career in STEM. So why is this important? Because the digital skills that they learn today are the gateway to a future of work that starts by making digital learning inclusive and accessible to all. Diversity of thought and access to digital learning are what makes the future of work innovative. These tools will allow today's generation to find futuristic solutions and create a stronger, kinder, and a better world. Thank you. So, Goli, they had just to have a new yet, at the wall, they were load. And it's now a Kalyono of the Aga, they were going to go Hello everyone, uh, my name is Deha Jistahawi. I'm Turtle Clan and I belong to the Anishinaabe and Onyotaga Nations. Uh, I'm currently a digital artist and I've been doing that full time for a good while now. You know, I never really figured I'd be doing this kind of job. Uh, when I was a kid, I always grew up thinking I'd be going the university or college route, like my mom and dad. But there was something that was always keeping me away from doing that and what that happened to be was making artwork. You know, I was uh, going through elementary school. I was, um, I certainly had my pencil to the paper, but I wasn't doing any kind of schoolwork or anything like that. What I was really doing was um, sitting there drawing Pokemon and dinosaurs and things like that. And I'd catch a good bit of flack from the teachers for doing that too. I'd be sitting there and they'd pull me off to the side or something and tell me, you know, you gotta quit doing that. And uh, it would, that, would, that would keep the artwork at bay for a good couple of days and it would creep back up on there. But high school wasn't any different either. You know, I'd sit there and mind you, I wasn't drawing dinosaurs and Pokemon anymore, but I was sitting there thinking about all the artwork I wanted to do, just kind of daydreaming and things like that. So I would sit there thinking about all the artwork that I wanted to do and then I'd go back home and just get her done. And so I think it was around that time I was, I had a pretty good summer job. I was like 16 or 17 years old and it was right there. I had enough money to buy myself a decent digital art setup. And I, I started getting into that medium, familiariz familiarizing myself with it. And eventually I realized that my capacity to create artwork now that I had a digital medium um, just exploded. Because right then and there in that little digital art software, I had all the colors of the rainbow, all the brushes I needed, and more than enough canvases I could use in a lifetime. So I started uh, continuing to work through this, this uh, new digital art medium, and 
as time went on, I started thinking about what I wanted to be as an artist. And I figured I wanted to start sharing my story and my perspectives as a young Indigenous man navigating colonialism. And so I believe it was, uh, yeah, in 2019, the fall of 2019, I was going to college or pretending to go to college for a good two months before I dropped out. And that's when I made the, the dive into uh, doing artwork full time. And then the lovely year of 2020 came around. I ended up getting hired by the Indigenous Friends Association alongside just uh, doing different kinds of client work with various organizations and um, businesses and academic institutions. And the style I was working in was woodland style art, except it was digital. And so a lot of folks came to me for this style of artwork because they wanted me to portray stories that they wished to have translated into um, a mural or a piece of artwork that people could look at. And so with the Indigenous Friends Association, um, I ended up sending them my artwork and my resume and they took a liking to my work and figured, yeah, we'll, we'll hire you on. And uh, so there I went, starting to help them because uh, they were relatively new at the time. So I helped them kind of brand themselves, put together some imagery for their website and things like that. And they had this this really amazing course that they were offering for indigenous indigenous folks. And this course was coding, except the only difference was that uh, this, this method of teaching had indigenous ways of learning intertwined with it. And so because everything was remote at the time, uh, we had indigenous folks from all over the place joining in for this. And eventually they figured, you know, you, you should hop in there and teach some digital art. And what that eventually led to was me and my coworker coming up with the idea of having a, a uh, digital art course, something that was solely focused on digital art. So we went and started doing that and, and the turnout was amazing. We had indigenous folks all over the place hopping in. I would teach them anything from the basics all the way to you know, starting to make an actual living off your work. And so one thing that I learned through these courses is that a lot of folks, a lot of indigenous folks, they, they don't have the access to proper art supplies. And in addition to that, sometimes they may have had, uh, they may have been discouraged from creating artwork. And so we would have these little graduations at the end of every course, and it would just be an opportunity to celebrate the artwork we made and uh, just raise each other up and motivate each other to keep on what they, what they started doing at the beginning of the course. And a lot of folks would share these, these reflections and these realizations that, man, I, I lost the, I lost the uh, motivation to do art a long time ago and now I finally feel like I, I can do it again. Like my creativity got reignited within me. And a lot of that brought a tear to my eye because I, I can relate to a lot of that, not being able to afford art supplies and not being able to uh, you know, do art where I felt like it was a safe space to do it. And so I believe that digital art can help remedy those things. When I bought that, that iPad and that little pencil that comes with it, and I started doing artwork, I realized I didn't have to go to the art store and you know, spend half a paycheck on supplies and all that. And for a lot of indigenous folks, they can't even make it out to, a, to an art store. Where I'm living right now, I'm uh, living in Chimna Singh, uh, some folks might know it as Christian Island or Beausoleil First Nation. I had to go to the art store a few weeks ago, and it took me about uh, four or five hours round trip to get out there. It's difficult. If I didn't have my little beat down Chevy Colorado, I probably wouldn't even thought about going out there to begin with. So it's, uh, I believe that digital art will be the remedy that us indigenous folks I believe it will be the remedy for the lack of accessibility for us indigenous folks in our artwork. Because we're, we're storytellers. You know, our, story, our storytelling preserves our culture. It's how we share, it's how we learn. And it's how we instill ourselves with a sense of belonging and purpose. So I believe that digital art will help remedy that. All it requires is a little, uh, a little iPad or you know, even your uncle's dusty computer sitting in the corner and uh, an inspired Indigenous individual. Yoko, thank you.
Hello. My name is Gordon Chan, and I'm the Innovation Lab Manager at the Future Skills Center, which we call the FSC. And for those of you who, don't, who aren't familiar with us, FSC is a pan-Canadian initiative focused on driving innovation in skills development. And we do this by partnering with over 240 organizations across the country to address current and future-oriented um, future -oriented labor market challenges and opportunities. And as FSC looks ahead, the need for Canadians to build digital skills is very clear. Our lives are becoming increasingly digitized. Everything from economic to civic and cultural participation. And consequently, Canada's labor force requires a significant boost to our digital capacity if we are to realize the opportunities available. The Information and Communications Technology Council forecasted that between 2021 and 2025 alone, 250,000 jobs will be added to Canada's digital economy, which includes occupations such as graphics designers, database analysts, and information systems analysts. And while we struggle to meet this growing demand, organizations such as the Council for Canadian Academics note that women, Indigenous youth, and other groups remain significantly underrepresented in technology-skilled positions. And so the question that we are asking ourselves at the FSC is how, is how can we effectively upskill Canadians? How can we create more pathways to career mobility so that these digitally skilled opportunities become accessible to even more people in this country? Now, first we should acknowledge that it is possible to support workers to transition to a digital career. Research from the Conference Board of Canada and FSC shows that 86% of high-risk occupations, such as administrative assistants or machinists, have one or more transition pathway to a digital career that is rapidly growing after a year of training, which means that most people can make the switch to a digital career. People do not need to be left behind by technological change, and the amount of time and effort required to make a transition does not have to be insurmountable. Now, there are a variety of transition programs and they can take many, many forms, but here are a few of the examples that we're seeing. Empower Canada is an organization that prepares unemployed and underemployed youth across this country for, techno for technology careers by offering free training in digital skills and professional skills. In its first cohort, 85% of graduates were employed or enrolled in higher education within 11 months. And by its third cohort, 68% of graduates achieved the same in only four months. In Calgary, the Edge Up program transitions displaced oil and gas workers to digital careers through a collaboration between the federal government, municipal governments, and academic institutions. And after 14 months, over 70% of these mid-career workers were able to find employment in new technology jobs, or they're furthering their education. And here in the Greater Toronto Area, Rogers, Rogers Cybersecurity Catalyst prepares individuals across the country for cybersecurity careers, especially those from underrepresented groups. Women and persons of color make up only 10% of Canada's cybersecurity workforce, but 57% of the program's graduates are women, and 68% of its students self-identify as racialized persons. Our team at FSC is now busy analyzing these and other promising models to, to extract the insights that they hold, but I want to share with you two of the emerging lessons that we're seeing. Firstly, digital upskilling efforts are most successful when they include both technical and non-technical skills, such as verbal communication and problem solving. The transition programs mentioned earlier work to train hybrid talent. Individuals who understand not just digital technology, but also how to match this technology with organizational needs. Through applied projects and work integrated learning, program participants integrate these non-technical skills into their digital initiatives. And this is important because digital abilities can become outdated in three to five years as new innovations emerge, but non-technical skills allow program participants to adapt and remain competitive far into the future. Second, employer engagement really is critical, and it needs to be expanded. EdgeUp, for example, spent more than six months investigating the skills needs of employers, and Empower Canada partnered with more than 200 employers 
to understand their IT hiring needs. And that being said, many of FSC's project partners still tell us that, employing, uh, that engaging employers remains challenging. In Canada, employer engagement can be especially difficult because small and medium enterprises make up 90% of private sector employment in this country, compared with only 50% in the United States. Because our companies are often smaller, these, can, these programs in Canada often have to engage more employers just to provide the same number of job opportunities to their program participants. It can also be difficult to persuade companies to put in the effort needed to design on-ramps to rapidly changing occupations or to, uh, to revise their HR processes to accommodate non-traditional candidates. And while the time and effort required can deter some organizations, research shows that, pro that employers who partner closely with transition programs, they see lower staff turnover and higher productivity. There is still a lot we need to do in this space, but transitioning individuals from high risk jobs to high growth digital careers is absolutely possible. And we invite you all to take a part. Everybody here in this theater and everybody online, we invite everybody to play a part. Collaborate with transition programs the next time you're looking to hire digital talent or encourage your industry association to connect with these programs and create a sector-wide initiative that you can join. Make sure your digital upskilling initiatives also build non-technical skills and advocate for HR policies that embrace candidates from a non-traditional background. With, our, with participation from stakeholders across the country, there is no doubt that Canada can provide an inclusive and competitive labor force needed in the next digital age. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Trisha Grant. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications at Media Smarts. That's Canada's Centre for Digital Media Literacy. We've been hearing a lot of really thought-provoking ideas here tonight, and it's clear that there are so many pieces to the puzzle when it comes to addressing the digital divide here in the country. The piece that I want to bring to you today is the importance of digital media literacy and the role it plays in helping close the gaps in that divide. Obviously, making sure that everyone has access to networked technology is a crucial first step. But we also need to focus on how we can help people use and engage with that technology in a way that's safe and beneficial. I sometimes think that not including digital media literacy education is kind of like handing someone the keys to a car and expecting them to drive without giving them any guidance on safety or rules of the road. One example of this was really clear during the COVID-19 crisis. You know, you needed access to a device with Wi-Fi to register for a vaccine, of course, but you also needed the skills to find and share trusted health information. Obviously, we saw the amount of misinformation that's spread around this, and we know there is a lot of work to do on this front. Today, we're constantly surrounded by media in various forms, and this is a really vast landscape that can be difficult to navigate. At Media Smarts, we believe that to help people of all ages thrive in a digital age, they not only need access to technology, of course, but the ability to use, understand, and engage with it responsibly. So let's break down those four key aspects that I'm talking about. So we've got access, use, understand, and engage. So first, access in the context of digital media literacy is really about having the opportunity to consume media using tools like search engines and streaming services. And secondly, use refers to the technical skills, some of the things we've been talking about tonight, to operate those platforms and digital tools, and that empowers everyone to be an active user of technology rather than a passive viewer. And then finally, we come to understand, which arguably is the most important aspect, because that really involves critical thinking, thinking about how and why media are created, how they impact us as users, and also how we access and share information. The media industry has changed a lot since I graduated from journalism uh, school in 2009. And now it's really even more important than ever for people to understand how journalism works and how to verify sources. Without these digital media literacy skills, new users of technology can really struggle to tell the difference between real and fake news, which is something you know, we all struggle with. 
We know that many older adults, including probably some of our parents or grandparents who are new to social media, can find this particularly challenging. And then finally, the fourth aspect of digital media literacy, engage, is about using media to connect with others, to be active in our communities, and to contribute positively. This is a vital part of digital citizenship. The digital world gives us so many powerful opportunities to engage, but we sometimes need to be reminded that we have to approach these spaces with mindfulness and a sense of responsibility. Unfortunately, online harms have become a regular occurrence in our digital lives, whether it's cybersecurity breaches, the impact of misinformation, cultures of hatred, those are just a few examples. And obviously, you know, governments and online platforms have a really important role to play here. We know that legislation and regulation alone aren't going to be enough. We really need an educational approach that empowers people and gives them the tools they need to navigate these spaces. As informed digital citizens, we could also use our collective power to hold platforms and governments accountable for concerns around our online safety and privacy. Canada has historically been a leader in the digital media literacy space, but unfortunately in recent years we've fallen behind. It's important that we make a national investment and commitment to lifelong digital media literacy education, from making sure it's integrated into the curriculum from an early age, to providing accessible programs for adult learners. At Media Smarts, we've also been advocating for a national digital media literacy strategy to fully realize the right to this education and to help bridge the digital divides that are embedded in social, economic, and cultural contexts, which all intersect with categories of race, class, gender, and age. While this education has to be lifelong, we also know how important it is to start with children and youth. Teaching young people digital skills like coding and how to make the most out of AI is obviously incredibly important. And just as an aside, I tried to use ChatGPT to add a joke into my script, but all it did was give me a bad knock-knock joke completely out of context. So there's some work to be done there. Um, and so unfortunately, you're stuck with my not-so-funny words. <laughs> In any case, all this education for young people around digital skills has to be accompanied by digital media literacy education. This will help make sure that our future leaders are mindful and aware of issues related to representation, equity, privacy, and online safety. Last year, Media Smarts launched the first ever Digital Citizen Day as part of our annual Media Literacy Week, and this year it takes place October 25th. And it's an opportunity for us to all think about the role we play in making our online world a better place. As someone who works on social media platforms every day as part of my job, I'm deeply invested in improving our online spaces. And by giving everyone, especially young people, the opportunity, opportunity to learn these critical digital media literacy skills, I really believe we can create a safe, inclusive, and equitable digital society. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ron Bennett. I'm the Global Vice President of IT for Linamar Corporation. We're a manufacturing company based out of Guelph, uh, Canada's second largest manufacturer of components for the uh, automotive industry. I'm here to talk to you a little bit about how industrial manufacturing plays a part in digital equity. So in man industrial manufacturing, three, 4.6, and seven are some pretty important numbers to us. They can help us understand where we are today. And what they represent and why are they important? Well, three is the half-life of technology today. And 4.6 is the average tenure for technical positions in manufacturing. The relationship between those two numbers and digital equity is something we're gonna talk about. And then there's the number seven. What does the number seven have to do with it? Well, I have seven minutes to tell you how those numbers are intertwined and then make you think differently about that. With everything technical, there's a lot of fine print. So the first thing we need to take into consideration is the half-life of technology isn't really scientifically quantifiable measurement. It's rather a metaphorical expression of the pace at which technology changes, where it becomes outdated or loses value. Second is that the pace of change is actually slowing down today, even though it doesn't feel like it. We're in a bit of a stabilization period. And it's generally caused by uh, increasingly complex software algorithms outdoing the compute power that they're running on. 
So how long will that stabilization period last? Well, we're not really sure. So I did what any good engineer and technology person would do, is I asked ChatGPT4. They came back and said, uh, we really don't know, but it's going to come. And when quantum computing does come, it will have a profound effect on the half-life of technology. It's predicted that it will start the fifth industrial revolution. And the fourth just feels like it started not that long ago. So what will the future look like? What's the fifth industrial revolution look like? Well, let's look back in time, and that will give us some context. So we've had four industrial revolutions in the life on Earth. The first one took about 4.5 billion years to occur, and it started in the late 1700s. The second happened about 100 years later than that, and it, and it became uh, going, really starting in the late 1800s. The third happened about 50 years after the second, and the fourth took about 20 years after the third. So when you look at those numbers, every success in Industrial Revolution happens twice as fast as the previous, with the exception of the first one. So what does that mean to industri uh, industry? Well, that means that we have to understand the pace of change is incredibly fast, and that historically, from an industrial perspective, the pace of change was at a snail's pace. The institutions that created the pace of change previously no longer set the pace of change in the world today. Industry and society now sets that timing. So let's go back to the numbers for a second. Three years is the half-life of technology. If we have graduates coming out of a four-year course, they're losing a significant portion of their technology teachings before they even enter the workforce. And for high school students, it's even worse if they don't pursue a post-secondary education. I think educational systems are having a difficult time keeping up with the pace of change. Should they? Personally, I think industry believes they shouldn't. I think industry believes they should focus on the fundamentals of math, science, English, social studies, the arts, physical education, not necessarily teaching it technology. They should use technology to improve the efficiency of the teaching process, but not focus on it. Most importantly, I think they need to generate critical thinkers, problem solvers that have really good communication skills. That's what industry needs today. Industry has 28 million workers in the Canadian workforce. We need to think of those 28 million workers as people on a journey for lifelong learning, and industry should be part of that. Industry should help solve the problem. We've been doing innovation since the beginning of time. Continuous improvement is what manufacturing does. It takes lower skilled workers and moves them into higher skilled value-added work. People are afraid of losing their jobs whenever we talk about automation. It's not perfect but there's progress if we can upskill them. Especially those that are age 50 and over. They're probably the most vulnerable in the workforce today. That's also a demographic that's growing at 1% per year. So closing the divide in that group has wide-reaching benefits. They still talk, they still meet for coffee face-to-face, -face, and they can do a significant amount of peer-to-peer -peer learning, which will significantly help us conquer the divide. So what do we have to do to support them? Well, we got to keep things simple for them. At Linamar, we run a cybersecurity training program for all of our employees. It's a constant learning. They go through it four times a year. Uh, four times a year, and they learn how cyber attacks happen. They learn and understand what email phishing is and how not to become a victim of it. It's been a, an incredibly successful program, and it's a win-win. They provide their peers some more information and can do peer-to-peer -peer teaching, and it helps keep our business and institutions safe. In 2022, we deployed AI and machine learning. And we did it through a council process. We brought together the entire workforce, all demographics, all ages, all groups within the organization. We asked them to create a program to upskill 
their people on how to use data, how to learn to code in machine learning, use Python, use various scripting to generate uh, insights and then act on those to create continuous improvement. They gained understanding of data use. They understand now the power of data and how you can gain insights from it. And hopefully they can take that back to their children and explain how social media can sometimes use data inappropriately. So we can use technology to help close the digital divide, but technology alone cannot do it. It needs our guidance. We need to create the strategy. We need to think critically. Using AI and ChatGPT is absolutely a learning process. It will be more efficient by using those tools, but we have to understand the limits. Really, it comes down to embracing technology and remembering the only difference today is the automation and robotics are digital, not mechanical. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Reka Raumaya. My pronouns are she and her, and I serve as the CEO at Canada Learning Code. Um, we are a not-for-profit charitable organization, and our mission is to bring di digital literacy to Canadians from coast to coast to coast. So one very quick show of hands to all those who are in the auditorium. How many of you accessed a smartphone or a digital device today to do something? And I know how everybody online is placed, so no need to raise your hand on that one. I see very, very high raised hands. I'm going to coin a term here, and uh, not anything scientific, not anything uh, approved by any economist. I'm going to call us all digitally privileged. <laughs> the reason I use the word privilege is because studies have shown that the level of access that you and I and those that are watching from home have is actually quite disproportionate in Canada. There are communities that face disproportionate barriers to the level of access that we have here. Deloitte, Future Skills, and Catalyst have done deep research on this and published a couple of reports, and they've identified some of these communities and groups. And the who's who that you would expect are on it. Women, seniors, people with lower income, BIPOC individuals, do, newcomers to Canada. The groups that are typically equity deserving are also in the demographic of lacking digital access, which further exacerbates the consequences of um, not having equitable access. So in this report, uh, Deloitte further describes what they mean when they say digital equity. They talk about three things. They say the first is access, the second is participation, the third is ecosystem. Access, you've got a device, awesome. Now, do you have access to the internet, actually? I don't think any of you will be surprised to know that Canada is among the most expensive places for internet access. We're actually second highest rates in the G7, not a ranking that I'm particularly fond of when it comes to ranking. And many times, I would think that, of course, we're a large country. We have very remote uh, provinces, northern communities. Of course, it makes sense that internet access and broadband access is hard and expensive. But my eyes were opened very recently when we worked in our community in Toronto, where uh, Canada Learning Code is serving 19 after-school programs. And the biggest challenge we discovered that our learners had was, one, they didn't have devices. And two, their families actually couldn't afford internet. So we couldn't really do sustainable programming and follow up. We couldn't really teach them how to code because they didn't have devices. We solved that problem, but it's a little bit of a band-aid, honestly. The second piece is participation. Participation is do you have the skills to participate or not? If you look at Stats Canada data, uh, they have forecasted by, that by 2050, 80% of the jobs in Canada will require some degree of STEM knowledge or technical skilling. Now, many of the jobs that will be lost or will be redefined in terms of 
the future are jobs that are today held by women and newcomers to Canada, as well as racialized individuals. So if we have to keep them in the workforce, which we do, we are not a very large country, we need everyone who can work to work. If we have to keep them in the workforce, we do in fact have to provide them with the skills. The third piece is the ecosystem, which is the safeguards that we need. So when generative AI arrives, and arriving it is, the systems that are in place, such as our education systems, actually know what to do with it instead of being paralyzed by fear. So you're sitting here, you're sitting at home, you're thinking, okay, what do I do as an individual? There are some small things that we all can do. You can support uh, programs that take used laptops and devices and repurpose them and give them to people who need. You can actually go and talk to your schools, local schools, and ask them um, whether computer science and computational thinking is a part of their curriculum. You'll be shocked to know that not all provinces have this as a part of their curriculum. And almost 90% uh, of our educators were not formally trained in delivering these type of things. You could also come and volunteer with organizations such as Canada Learning Code or many others. There are organizations like the Indigenous Friends, uh, Friends Association and Pinguac, where as a not-for-profit, we go and we work with communities that need the access and we teach them through access, participation, and the ecosystem. I know that for the longest time, we have been an economy that has been fueled through non-renewable resources. It is time for us to start using our most sustainable resources, which are our people. And in order to do that, we do have to lean in we do have to provide them with the ability, the capability, and the safeguards that they need to actually meaningfully participate, more importantly, to prosper in the digital economy. And that's why I say that we are privileged. Let's convert that privilege into a right. Every person in Canada needs to have digital equity, which is a fundamental right, shouldn't be a privilege. Thank you very much. A great list of action items. Wow, what a lineup. Thank you again to Daniel Monroe, Doina Unshell, Gista Kennedy, Gordon Chan, Trisha Grant, Ron Bennett, and just now, Reka Romaya. A round of applause for our talkers this evening. I'd now like to invite our event partner to take the stage. Please welcome a director at Deloitte Digital, Chris Mudiap Papele. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you uh, to our speakers. Uh, thank you for the good work that you're doing as well, wherever you are. Thank you also to the audience here. Uh, thank you for uh, everyone who's attending remotely as well. Um, one of our speakers pointed out to me that I'm <laughs> keeping you from the reception or from your evenings at home, so I'll keep, I'll keep my thoughts brief. Um, this has actually been very surreal for me because uh, a little over 20 years ago, maybe not a little over, over 20 years ago, my first class at U of T was in this, in this theater. Um, and so I used to come a couple times a week and sit somewhere over there. Um, so um, yeah, I, I consider myself really privileged uh, and pr really blessed, uh, really lucky to be in a position uh, to be able to stand in front of all of you. Um, I have uh, spent 20 years as a technologist, um, roughly speaking. Uh, I was freelancing as a web developer when I was in university, uh, and that's ultimately led to me having um, a successful career. Um, and um, the, the reality, though, is that 
it didn't, it, it was, it happened by accident, I think is what it, what it comes down to. Um, I came to Canada when I was five years old. I immigrated from Sri Lanka. Um, uh, as you may or may not know, uh, there was a civil war there. Um, and so I came here as a refugee. Um, and uh, I happened to end up in Toronto. There was a bunch of different places we could have gone, but we ended up in Toronto. Um, there were these particular milestones throughout my life. You know, I happened to be in uh, a school where I was able to access computers. Uh, my parents decided to send me to an out of, I said, you know, we lived downtown Toronto. I went to high school in Scarborough because there was a program there that uh, enabled technology access. Um, you know, I happened to learn how to become a web developer in my free time when I was in high school. So. There, there's been a series of events in my life um, that um, ultimately were about digital skills that I acquired um, that have allowed me uh, and my family to, to thrive in Canada. Um, and I think ultimately, um, as all the panelists, uh, all the speakers have said, the, the, the work that we're doing at Deloitte, speaking, speaking on these topics, I think if we're successful, stories like mine are just par for the course, right? They shouldn't be the exception. They shouldn't be these inspiring things that we that we hear. Um, and so, um, you know, we're we're proud of this work uh, and these papers that we're that we've put out, um, and we will continue to advocate for this um, because we believe it's uh, critical not just for um, us as a country, uh, but ultimately it's necessary for. Uh, everyone, uh, whether you're an immigrant or you've been here since time immemorial, whether you're a First Nations or you're a settler, whether you're, whether you're young or, or, an, or an elder, these skills are critical for, um, for ultimately, I think, for us to, to thrive and live a good life. Um, and so, again, thank you for being part of this conversation. Uh, we're grateful that you're here, uh, and please do keep this in, in your mind and in your thoughts uh, as you leave. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for your story, but also your partnership. Now, I'm going to invite our talkers to get up and head towards the reception. And while they do that, I'm going to tell the rest of the room and our audience home a bit more about the walrus. So yeah, get up. You can get a head start. As some of you may know, the Walrus Lab has been privileged to work with Deloitte on the podcast Courage Incorporated. It's hosted by Duncan Sinclair and features top names in Canadian business, speaking about what it takes to be a courageous leader. So be sure to take a listen wherever you find your podcasts. And if you enjoyed tonight's talks and... Uh, I heard some laughs and cheers, and uh, uh, if you want more, stay tuned because we have one more talks this season. On Wednesday, June 28th, we'll be back right here at the Isabel Bader Theater, also live streaming for the Walrus Talks Artificial Intelligence presented by Google. A hot topic for sure, but also a related topic to tonight's talks. We also encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. You can do that if you are here in the room outside when you visit the walrus table. We'll also send an email tomorrow where you can opt in. It's the best way to stay in touch with us at the walrus. Also, consider subscribing. We have a special offer for those of you in the room, a full year subscription of the walrus. That's eight issues delivered right to your door for just $25. If you visit the walrus table, someone will be sure to set you up. For 20 years now, the walrus has been home to Canada's conversation. And in our increasingly complex world of shrinking newsrooms and encroaching media conglomerates, our work, our independent work is more important than ever. We're able to do this work thanks to our community of donors and sponsors. Help us secure our future and consider supporting independent media and fact-based journalism with a donation. You can do so online at thewalrus.ca, click on donate or just stop by the table. All gifts, $20 or more, do receive a charitable tax receipt. Thanks again to the team at Deloitte for making this conversation possible, but also for your commitment and research in the work of digital skills. A big thank you to the Walrus's 2023 national partners, Air Canada, Inspire, and Rogers. And thank you to our audience. 
We really appreciate you being part of tonight's talks in person and online, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Have a great evening.